It's Wednesday, May 11th, 2022. I'm Jackson Bird. Today, how data can help us find happiness in romantic relationships, or at least tell us why we're dating all wrong. Plus, it turns out sleep deprivation can affect how we see other people. And a new website for finding and reporting dinosaur sightings in your area and around the world. Here's some cool stuff for your ride home. Well, I have a feeling that this is going to resonate with a lot of you listening. Let's talk about using data to improve our dating game. Seth Stevens Davidovitz has a new book out this week called Don't Trust Your Gut, Using Data to Get What You Really Want in Life. And there was an excerpt published in Wired recently focusing on how we might use data to find our optimum life partner, which Stevens Davidovitz lightly refers to as the most consequential decision of a person's life. Now, historically, he points out, there hasn't actually been a lot of data in so-called relationship science. There just haven't been too many huge studies. But a few years ago, psychology researcher Samantha Joel combined the data of a lot of those smaller studies to create a sample size of 11,196 couples. Although, like with most of these studies, it focused only on heterosexual couples. Most studies on LGBTQ plus folks are still of the, wow, gay people really exist, huh? variety, and not so much the inclusion in interesting studies about dating behavior like everyone else variety. But anyways, for all of these straight couples, Joel's team had a ton of data. By polling from all of these different studies, she and her team had access to the people's demographics, their sexual tastes, their physical appearances, their values, their health, their hobbies, and more. And after using machine learning to comb through the huge data set, Joel's team ultimately found that we still really don't know why people end up with each other or what factors lead them to being happy together in the long term. If anything, the study just underscored how unpredictable humans are, especially when it comes to love and relationships. Most of those data points had surprisingly little impact on whether two individuals were in a happy romantic relationship. But the study did indicate some other things, especially around desirability versus happiness. That is, what people are looking for or think they should be looking for versus what might actually make them happy with a partner in the long term. In Joel's study, some of those data points they had on people did slightly increase odds of happiness, but the ones that appeared to matter based on that study are not the ones we see people focusing on most in other studies or in real-world examples, especially in online dating. And that is a field in which we do have a ton of data. Many teams of researchers have analyzed data from online dating sites, and it turns out that analyzing people's behavior around desirability is way easier than analyzing what makes people happy together in a relationship. Stevens Davidovitz says a recent study found that we not only know whether person A will swipe right on person B, but we know how long it will take person A to swipe. As he puts it, quote, good romantic partners are difficult to predict with data. Desired romantic partners are easy to predict with data. And that suggests many of us are dating all wrong, end quote. So here's some of the things that generally make people desirable to others. None of it is all too surprising. Conventional attractiveness, particularly being tall for men, a person of a desired race, someone with money, for men, someone in an enforcement profession like a firefighter or a lawyer, someone with a sexy name, which seems pretty subjective, but all right, and finally, someone who is similar to ourselves. Apparently, people are 11.3% more likely to match with a person who has the same initials as themselves. So that's what people think that they want. But for anyone looking to actually be happy in a relationship, especially in the relatively long term, we've got to go back to the findings from Joel and her team's study. So the eight traits that the study found to be the least predictive of happiness, so much so that Stephen Davidovitz dubbed them the irrelevant eight, are race or ethnicity, religious affiliation, height, occupation, physical attractiveness, previous marital status, sexual tastes, and similarity to oneself. So pretty dang close to the top things people look for and value highest when dating. Cool. 
But Joel's study did also give us some actionable advice based on their finding of what does predict happiness in a relationship. And that boils down to three questions you can ask yourself. Were you satisfied in your life before you met this person? Were you free from depression before you met this person? And did you have a positive affect before you met this person? Now, that obviously doesn't work when you're swiping through Hinge because you haven't met the person and started a relationship yet, but it does work towards doing a bit of self-analysis, even if you aren't in a relationship. Quoting Stevens Davidovitz, Researchers have found that people who answered yes to questions such as these are significantly more likely to report being happy in their romantic relationship. In other words, a person who is happy outside their relationship is far more likely to be happy inside their relationship as well. Further, and this is quite striking, how a person answered questions about themselves was roughly four times more predictive of their relationship happiness than all the traits of the romantic partner combined, end quote. So, yes, like every cliche dating advice ever, it turns out that the real key to finding the romantic relationship of your dreams is by being happy and fulfilled on your own first. Now, if that outcome is a little disappointing to you, I want to share this great point from Stevens Davidovitz, quote, This relates to an important point about living a data-driven life. We data geeks may be the most excited when we learn of a finding that goes against conventional wisdom or cliched advice. This plays to our natural need to know something that the rest of the world doesn't. But we data geeks must also accept when the data confirms conventional wisdom or cliched advice. We must be willing to go wherever the data takes us, even if that is to findings like those featured on daily inspirational quotes, end quotes. A great point about the scientific method. And also, even though the big takeaway here was that you have to make your own happiness and not depend on a hypothetical future partner to provide it, these studies were also useful in reminding us that a lot of those things that we think we value in a relationship or those traits that we look for when swiping probably aren't a great predictor of how amazing a relationship might be. Love, it turns out, is still a mystery, no matter how much data analysis you throw at it. Well, as I am writing and recording this on a day when I feel like I could fall asleep at any second because I have been getting very little sleep for several days, this story feels particularly relevant. A new study published last week in the journal Nature and Science of Sleep has found that being sleep-deprived can actually change the way we see other people. Quoting Science Alert, when we've gone without sleep, we spend less time fixing our gaze on other people's faces, the study shows. As that's a crucial part of reading social cues from those around us, our relationships could potentially suffer. And what's more, after sleep loss, angry faces appear to us to be less trustworthy and less healthy, while neutral or fearful faces come across as less attractive compared to when we've had a full night's sleep. End quote. So maybe don't do any Tinder swiping when you're sleep deprived because everyone will look less attractive. But on a more serious note, lead author and sleep researcher Lee Van Eggman points out, quote, since facial expressions are crucial to understanding the emotional state of others, spending less time fixating on faces after acute sleep loss may increase the risk that you interpret the emotional state of others inaccurately or too late, end quote. And fellow researcher neuroscientist Christian Benedict adds that this could result in people having less motivation to interact socially, which I have personally felt when sleep-deprived, for sure. Now, I will say that this study specifically focused on young adults, an age group that tends to be particularly prone to not getting enough sleep, so the researchers acknowledge that their results may not be generalizable to other age groups. But, you know, I'd say the idea that you aren't as gracious towards others' intentions when you're sleep-deprived is a pretty common observable occurrence, so as a layperson, I'd be inclined to cautiously expand the findings in my own interpretation here. The study also didn't really account for chronic sleep deprivation, like you might see in new parents, for example, so I do wonder how much worse this could get or what other effects might be observed. But as for the actual study, quoting again from Science Alert, 
The study authors recruited 45 participants who went through a night without sleep and another eight hours of slumber, separated by at least a week. In each case, eye-tracking sensors were used the morning after to monitor the gaze of the subjects as they looked at images of faces. A mix of expressions were shown on the faces, happy, angry, fearful, and neutral. Participants were also asked to rate the attractiveness, trustworthiness, and healthiness of the faces they saw. And when it came to face fixation, there was a drop in duration between 6.3 and 10.6% after sleep loss, and this drop happened irrespective of the motion being shown. Overall, faces were rated as less trustworthy and less attractive after a night without sleep. End quote. It's possible that the already well-documented effects of poor sleep like struggling to pay attention and being slower to interpret emotions is at play here, but further studies with larger and more diverse sample sizes will need to be conducted. So just another reminder that we should all probably be getting more sleep than we actually are. The guidance has long been around 8 hours for adults, but another new study published last week in the journal Nature Aging indicates that the magic number might actually be closer to 7. Using data on 500,000 middle-aged to senior adults in the UK, the research team found that more or less than seven hours of sleep brings fewer benefits for cognition and mental health. They noted in the conversation, quote, sleep regularity seems to be linked to the brain's default mode network, or DMN, which involves regions that are active when we are awake, but not engaged in a specific task, such as resting while our mind wanders. This network includes areas that are important for cognitive function, such as the posterior cingulate cortex, which deactivates during cognitive tasks, parietal lobes, which process sensory information, and the frontal cortex, which is involved in planning and and complex cognition. There are signs that in adolescents and young adults, poor sleep may be associated with changes in connectivity within this network. This is important as our brains are still in development into late adolescence and early young adulthood. Disruption in this network may therefore have knock-on effects on cognition, such as interfering with concentration and memory-based processing, as well as more advanced cognitive processing. End quote. So that backs up the findings a bit from the other study on sleep deprivation and perception of people's faces in young adults. But the actual study on the optimal amount of sleep was focused on aging adults and the interplay between aging causing sleep problems and sleep problems exacerbating age-related conditions. For example, their study suggests that getting the right amount of sleep can both protect against dementia and help alleviate symptoms of it by protecting memory. Sleep is important for us at every phase of our lives. As babies and children, it is crucial in supporting growth, behavior, emotional regulation, and cognition. In adolescence, it's again crucial in cognitive function that can affect social and emotional perception, and as we get older and sleep becomes a harder and harder task to achieve, it becomes even more important in keeping our mental health in check. So maybe it's time to download some of those nighttime meditation apps again or re-implement some other sleep hygiene hacks like keeping your devices in another room and turning them off an hour before getting ready for bed. While the fine details of a lot of these studies can vary, the never-airing takeaway is that we humans desperately need our sleep. Jurassic World Dominion comes out June 9th in the US, and even though I haven't loved the previous two installments, they have caught me hook, line, and sinker with this one by bringing back Laura Dern, Sam Neill, and Jeff Goldblum as their original characters. I am absolutely going to go see it, at least in the hypothetical world where I actually make it to theaters more than once a year. But anyways, in the lead up to the film's release, Jurassic World has just released a new website called Dino tracker. If you go to dinotracker.com, you'll find a map of the world with blinking alerts all over it showing recent dinosaur sightings. You can click on them to find out more about the sighting and about the dinosaur that was spotted. For example, in Maine, there's a video of a cyclist falling off their bike when they encounter a stegosaurus in the woods. In County Mayo, Ireland, a driver had to stop in the middle of the road to let a herd of triceratops pass. And in Vancouver, there's a whole nest of pteranodons that apparently have been there since 2001. 
Every sighting includes a photo or video shot by the person who spotted the dinosaur, as well as the aggression level of the dinosaurs. You can also access a field guide with more information about each species and instructions on what to do or not to do if you encounter them. The whole site is being run by the in-universe Department of Prehistoric Wildlife, which has some really great National Parks-style branding. The DPW notes, quote, There are dinosaurs all around the world. As these animals are highly desirable to illegal cloning operations, black market dealers, and breeders, many embryos and fully matured dinosaurs have been shipped around the globe as a result. Dinosaurs are here to stay, and their impact on our world is still being studied. Our objective here at DPW is to help humans and dinosaurs coexist through real-time monitoring and education. Occurrences of injury or death directly attributable to dinosaurs are rare. Similar to other wild predators, dinosaurs prefer to keep their distance and will typically avoid confrontation and interaction unless threatened." End quote. The idea that there is a Department of Prehistoric Wildlife and humans coexisting with dinosaurs around the world is in line with implications left hanging at the end of Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom, so this website seems to be setting the stage for the next chapter in the story. It's a simple thing, and not in any way mind-blowing, but the clever simplicity, the way it weaves in the story with our real world never breaking that fourth wall, reminds me a lot of the media activations we saw around 2013-ish, when franchises started getting a little more savvy to the fun possibilities of social media. Or of even earlier pre-social media eras, when some movies and TV shows with smart marketing folks would piece together entire scavenger hunts around towns with all kinds of codes that you had to break to get the clues. You know, maybe I just haven't been paying attention, but I feel like we haven't seen too much of that in a while. So, the Dino Tracker, as straightforward as it is, brought me a little bit of joy today. Well, that is it from me for today. This show was produced by Ride Home Media. I'm Jackson Bird, and I will talk to you again tomorrow.